Should we try with the, now we'll try with the mic on. Am I ready now? <laughs> Hello, my name is Tom McMahon. I'm the Department's Invasive Species Coordinator. Uh, thank you for joining me in our department's update of the Aquatic Invasive Species Program here at the department. I'm going to give you a quick, fairly concise update on our current AIS director's orders and the initial draft of the upcoming Arizona Aquatic Invasive Species Management Plan for 2011. Um, anybody that's attending here, I'm hoping you uh, signed in for attendance purposes. And, uh, and feel free to fill out any white comment cards that I have in the back there. Um, but as you can see, as we, the next slide I'll get to uh, gives you an opportunity for folks out there on the web um, that would like to make any comments. We do have a site for that, uh, AIS comments at azgfd.gov, but I'll get to that in a second. But I want to go through some of the public, uh, scheduled public meetings we have on these subjects. Uh, first one. Uh, we had on uh, Tuesday, November 30th uh, in Lake Havasu City. Uh, our second one is today. It's a webcast, and like I said, uh, we're, we're out, uh, out on the web on this, uh, but uh, you'll be able to view this at other times. We'll try and get it onto our website here in the next few days so that any time you can uh, take, a, take a look back at it. And then uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, December 15th, we'll be up in Page, and on Thursday, December 16th, two days from now, we'll be over in King talking about these same subjects. And I would like to point out at the bottom uh, if I can, that written public comment uh, deadline is Monday, January 10th. So we can get in those written comments. And uh, uh, before that or at that time, that'd be great. And uh, we're asking for those comments because that'll be included, actually, in our management plan. And uh, certainly the comments that we get will uh, direct our director's orders. Now some ground rules, just real quick. I uh, do have a PowerPoint presentation we'll go through here. And it, it touches the basics. Uh, we could be here for a long time if we were going through uh, the director's orders exactly as, as written and certainly uh, the, uh, the uh, management plan itself. But uh, three things I did want to point out was uh, AIS comments at azgfd.gov. Good way to uh, uh, send in your comments. So again, and you'll see that at the bottom of the slides. In fact, uh, the slide here has an AIS comments at azgfd.gov, so you don't have to write it down right now. You'll have a, some opportunity as we go along here. And uh, then uh, for further information, go right to our, uh, our website, our Game and Fish website, uh, azgfd.gov uh, backslash AIS, and you can learn everything you want to know about aquatic invasive species and certainly quagga mussels. So check that out if you get, if you get any time. The topics of discussion tonight, uh, who should care about AIS? Who should care about aquatic invasive species? Uh, and uh, what are these AIS director's orders? What are you talking about, Tom, that you're proposing, uh, especially the updates in 2011? And uh, what about that uh, AIS uh, management plan? Well, we're going to try and tie all those things together. Maybe we'll get some questions from the crowd. Uh, uh, but uh, like I said, and any time you want to send questions or comments in, maybe we can get back to you on some of that. So. So who should care? How about if you're an angler? Take a look at these beasties. On the, on the left here. That's an Asian carp. Could be silver carp, big head carp, uh, white aimer. Basically, these are flying fish that have invaded much of the Mississippi drainage. They've proven detrimental to fisheries biodiversity, the overall food web, and have actually injured boaters and skiers when they jump out of the water. Estimates are that, uh, that Asian carp make up 90% of overall fish biomass in uh, parts of the Mississippi. Uh, that's, that's certainly not good for fishing. How about this beastie over here? Northern snakehead, or frankenfish as we like to call them. Voracious predator that eats well, everything, and has the ability to move across land to other water bodies. Uh, it's native to China and Korea, and they will eat sport fish of any size. Nasty little fish. Not a little fish, actually, it's a big fish. So, maybe that doesn't impress you. How about, uh, that's a lake under there somewhere. That's a small lake in northeast Texas. Uh, it's covered by water hyacinth and giant salvinia. Very invasive plants, very invasive aquatic plants. Um, in the middle, how about uh, New Zealand mud snail? They cover bottom habitat, and that's not good for invertebrates or sport fishing at all. Uh, one subject we've talked about probably ad nauseum is uh, invasive mussels. Quag and zebra, that's actually zebra mussels there. And uh, no, they didn't crawl up that fishing pole while the person was fishing. But you can see that they'll, they'll just cover anything they want, the zebra and quagga mussel. And then this one here, 
No, that's not a giant lobster from a red lobster. That is actually uh, a crayfish from Australia, the red claw crayfish. Uh, it may be great in someone's aquarium, may actually be tasty, but it really could devastate a trout stream. How about a boater? I drill up there on the left, quaggin zebra. Uh, the zebra mussel at the bottom there just completely encrusting a boat motor. How about that uh, picture on the right from Lake Pleasant? That's, that's quagga right here next door to our game and fish office, for Pete's sakes, Lake Pleasant. These invasives clog up everything. Okay. Do you get power and water delivered to your home and business? I presume you do. Invasive mussels can really clog up everything there, too. On uh, the top left here, that's just a PVC pipe from California. It was in the water about three months. Notice it's completely occluded. That's quagga mussel right there. Uh, just below it, that grate was completely clean a year before that picture was taken in 2007. Yikes. And here's a, this one's a lot of fun. It's actually a, a Davis Dam penstock gate. Uh, as you notice, the date's 2007 when we found out that these things uh, got in Arizona. The gate's already completely covered, and uh, that's a weight problem right there. But one of the other things that's really a problem is uh, they uh, include all the holes that drain this penstock gate as they're trying to lift it. And that's not good for maintenance for the dams. They aren't real happy with that. Now, these pictures are taken from uh, inside a uh, dam infrastructure at Hoover, and then the one on the right is as ba back east. Uh, that can't be good. Uh, the one on the left there is the Hoover Dam uh, cooling water supply. Think about it. They don't, they don't maintain that every week. If this thing gets clogged up and one of the generators uh, overheats, again, that's not a good deal. And then at the bottom there, if you can read that, uh, talking about zebra mussels, uh, in just in the 1990s, but the Great Lakes power industry spent over $3 billion, with a B, dollars on abatement, trying to get rid of these things. That's a lot of money. Oop. So it takes us in 2009 to the Aquatic Invasive Species Interdiction Act that was passed in Arizona. Um, it gave the department various powers and authorities in addressing uh, the impending aquatic invasive species problem, including, like listed up there, a legislatively controlled funding mechanism, establishing an aquatic invasive species program in definition, and certain prohibitions, violations, and penalties. But I wanted to focus uh, this update uh, with, uh, on those uh, AIS director's orders, uh, like they're listed up there, such as uh, the actual listing of aquatic invasive species, then lists of aquatic invasive species affected waters, where those aquatic invasive species are, and then lastly, uh, it's probably important to most people, especially boaters, those mandatory conditions for movement from affected water bodies. So, Director's Order 1 basically is the aquatic invasive species list, and this is the current two-member sorority of uh, what is on Director's Order 1. Quagga mussel and zebra mussel. Started off with them first. So what we wanted to talk about tonight uh, was additions and updates to that list. Because there's, uh, to be honest, there's quite a few out there that have a real potential of affecting Arizona. These happen to be some of the ones that rose to the top fairly quickly here. They are rusty crayfish, red claw crayfish, New Zealand mud snail. Those are animals. <laughs> and then uh, two plants and or algae that we uh, felt were very important in that aquatic invasive species listing um, being Giant Salvinia, and uh, no, we didn't just pick this out because of its name, but Rock Snot, commonly known as Didymo or perhaps even Cymbala. Uh, but if you go to our website, you can uh, learn a little bit more about all these species. But let me, uh, let me show you some pictures of these guys. And by the way, I kind of mentioned it, but if you take a look in the middle of the slide there, uh, the risk assessments for these are actually on our website also. Again, at azgfd.gov backslash AIS. Um, the one on the left there is uh, rusty crayfish. That is actually a, a species that is uh, native to, uh, I guess, central North America, Indiana, Idaho, uh, Idaho for Pete's sakes, Indiana, uh, Ohio, places of that nature uh, where they can't. But rusty crayfish are a, a nasty little beast. They can get kind of big on you and, uh, again, eat you out of house and home. Certainly uh, displace the uh, 
non-native crayfish that we already have in our systems. Uh, guy in the middle there, that's a big one too. I, you saw a picture of him earlier. That's a red-clawed crayfish, Australian red-clawed crayfish. Again, a very large uh, crayfish uh, species and can really cause some damage to the ecosystem. Then the little guy there on the, on the right is a New Zealand mud snail. They may be little, but they're powerful. They, uh, uh, they uh, actually, uh, let's put it this way, they're born pregnant. They make lots of them. So they get in an area, they take off on you. Um, then the, the plants, again, uh, if you want to check out those risk assessments on our website, uh, the plant there on the uh, uh, left is a giant salvinia. Just a plant out there living its life, but the thing is, if you, you can see by its nature, it just completely covers an area. When it gets in there, it takes over and completely covers the uh, water surface. That's not good for light penetration. That's certainly not good for sport fishing. It's not good for anything in the lake, which may not become a lake anymore with this thing covering it. The next one on the right there is our, our friend rock snot, Didymo. Um, really, rock, uh, rock snot Didymo itself is a diatom. There's a little guy, again, out there living his life, but they uh, create massive colonies and, and live on stocks. They eventually uh, detach from those stocks, so again, the diatom floats away, maybe he dies, but the stocks stay there, and they form these large mats that can completely cover the bottom of a lake or a river. Yikes. Not good stuff. And it doesn't look very good either. It, it's, been, it's been said it kind of looks like dirty toilet paper. Do you really want that at the bottom of your stream? So those are the five new listees that we're looking at. And what I wanted to do was uh, kind of go over, uh, and that's Director's Order 1, adding those five species to the list. Director's Order 2, the update of that would be, well, how do we address then those new species on the list? Some of the updates we made were rather mundane. Uh, in rule, we've uh, created a, a definition of waters so we changed that because if you look in Director's Order 2 that we currently have, uh, the update is to waters instead of having water bodies. Kind of helped us out with the definition. A rose by any other name, but it's waters that we change it to. But uh, the important thing on, on this uh, slide is down near the bottom here. Oop. Luckily, Oklahoma and Texas have been added to the list of species that have uh, 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 zebra and or quagga mussel. So uh, somebody coming from those kind of states, we need to talk. We might need to talk to them as they come into the state with their watercraft to see if they've decontaminated their boat. But we'll get into that a little later here. But uh, more importantly, in Director's Order 2, what we've updated, I guess a little closer here, uh, is uh, uh, New Zealand mud snail. And then the second one was about rock snot and uh, didymo. And then uh, the last one was about giant salvinia. So we're talking about waters in Arizona where New Zealand mud snail have been documented. And they have been documented in the lower Colorado River below uh, Glen Canyon Dam, basically Lee's Ferry Reach. That should signal something to all of you. Lee's Ferry is kind of important. Lake Mead and then Lake Mojave, especially on the Willow Beach area, New Zealand mud snail. That's not good. Uh, rock snot. Again, uh, it, the rock snot that we've uh, detected has really been Symbala, and it's been documented as an invasive bloom. You must understand that uh, with uh, uh, the Didymo or even Symbala, that diatom, they're out there all over the place, similar to golden algae in Arizona. But when does it get to the point that it becomes invasive and blooms? Well, this is we had a case that uh, hit us uh, in the lower Colorado River there, Lake Havasu. So that's why that's on director's order, too. And then uh, continuing on, a giant salvinia where it was documented and present. But as you notice, it says directly connected waters. Um, there was uh, some evidence. For, well, actually, they're, it's still there. Uh, trying to get rid of this stuff is very hard. Uh, but um, on the lower Colorado River uh, in Blythe, California, basically, Palo Verde, uh, I'm sorry, the Palo Verde Irrigation District, the west side drain. And they already know they got it. Then, in fact, uh, Giant Salvinia was one of the first major aquatic invasives that hit the lower Colorado River. It's been contained at this point. Doesn't mean it's going to stay contained. Got to stay on the, got to stay on the upright on these things. So uh, that's why that's uh, another one that was listed. And that's how it ended up on Director's Order Number 2. Now, in Director's Order 3, that's uh, basically the mandatory conditions. This, this is the one that's probably most important to folks. It's one thing to make a list. It's one thing to say, well, if we think they're in this water or they are in this water, they've been documented. Great. What are we going to do about it? Uh, the mandatory conditions uh, for movement from affected water bodies, which was just listed in Director's Order 2. So some of the things that were actually changed up front, uh, I'm sorry, not changed, but updated, uh, kind of the same thing were uh, in yellow there, uh, the listed AIS waters that was we changed it from water bodies. And we did add under other equipment, helping define a little bit, 
Because when we say equipment, people go, well, what does equipment mean? Well, um, within rule, um, def uh, equipment is defined a little, uh, a little further, but in director's order, we just uh, wanted to make sure that people understood what they're talking about, their fishing gear, their anchor, things of that sort. Uh, basically, anything that gets into the water might have a chance of having some aquatic invasives that are listed attached, or maybe they got on there somehow. So let's go a little further. Uh, um, what we did with, the, and this, by the way, what we're, the section we're talking about under mandatory conditions is for day-use boaters. Day-use boaters are basically the folks that go to a lake uh, for the day, or maybe they go there just for the weekend. Maybe they go to a, a Lake Pleasant, and they're there for the weekend. They're a day-use boater. There's a real slim chance that they're going to have an adult quagga mussel or something else like that get attached to their boat that quick. Zebra mussel, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, a mud snail is not going to crawl up the, the anchor line and, and attach to your boat uh, that quickly. However, uh, there's small veligers and uh, planktonic and, and maybe some of the plants that we've talked about might. So that's why, again, we're talking about director's order three and day use, um, and, and specifically at this moment, boaters. Um, but removing any clinging material, removing the plug, drain the water, dry. Hopefully you've all heard that message, clean, drain, and dry. Clean your boat off, drain your boat, pull your plug, and specifically dry. And the reason that uh, dry is in yellow is because uh, we didn't have that at the beginning of the sentence uh, last, uh, in the last director's order. We thought that would be important because if you go straight down on that left-hand column there, you hear remove, which is clean, then drain, then dry. And then we just added some, uh, some of the plants and algae as examples because, again, they were going to be on director's order, so why not use them as an example of what to pull off of your, uh, your boat if, for Pete's sakes, you've got some giant salvini or rocks not hanging off there. Then uh, this is uh, probably a little bit more important part of uh, Director's Order 3 uh, in the update. Uh, some of the stuff at the top in yellow, um, the AIS waters, listed AIS waters, again, that was just uh, uh, rose by any other name. We just uh, tried to improve that. And then we added where it, where it was already stating in Director's Order 3 about removing uh, all attached invasive species. Well, I thought I'd give you some examples. Uh, the quagga mussel, New Zealand mud snail. But one of the more important additions, and this is something that was uh, put together by the aquatic invasive species team we have at the Game and Fish Department, is uh, uh, the yellow there, that's the note. And I'll go ahead and read that, because I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen, but note, to document appropriate and required decontamination, it is recommended that an aquatic invasive species boat inspection report, which is one of our forms, Form 2137, which we call AISBIR, be acquired, completed, signed, and filed for instructions with the Arizona Game and Fish Department's Aquatic Invasive Species Program, that's me, before transport of watercraft to any other Arizona waters or out of state. And this form is located on the department's website. Now, before we think, oh, my gosh, that's a cumbersome thing, Tom. Really, what it is, it's just a checklist to help people understand and look at how they're cleaning, draining, and drying that boat. If you're coming off of, and, and by the way, I would mention that this part is on the long-term use. So we're not looking at some any, anybody that comes off any of our lakes uh, the, uh, uh, you, again, so you use like pleasant example, you go for the weekend, you're not required to have a, a, an aquatic invasive species boat inspection report. However, if you've been at the marina for weeks, months, perhaps years, and you're going to transport your boat, yes, you will need to get this form, get it filled out, whether you be the transport or the owner. Uh, it's, not that, it's not as cumbersome as you might think, and actually it is a nice checklist so that you make sure that you do due diligence to clean that boat. And then at the bottom, we just, uh, again, we're adding examples to any hidden invasive species. Basically, we're trying to say adult quagga mussels. Because obviously, if we talk about hidden, spe hidden invasive species, if it's the veliger stage, which is planktonic for like a, a quagga or maybe even a small um, a mud snail, you're not going to see it, so how would you know that it was there? <laughs> so when we say uh, any hidden invasive species, we're kind of uh, getting people aware of the fact of, of uh, removing those, uh, those adults. Now, in finishing off the update for Director's Order 3, of course, we had some species that we added. So there were some things that, and additional protocols for movement from listed waters and, addition, and alternative protocols. The additional protocol uh, uh, at the top there, we talk about rock snot on the uh, Didymo. And again, I'll read that. And it's pretty simple. Dry and or disinfect using bleach, quaternary ammonia perhaps, all fishing equipment, including but not limited to felt-soled waders, boots, nets, tackle before we're using this equipment in any other water in Arizona. Basically, what we're asking folks to do, if you're leaving a, an AIS-listed wa uh, water, clean your equipment. 
Make sure it's dried off. That'll kill those things. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, and, and by the way, that you, you see these recommendations that have been up here and, and uh, things that we've talked about. Uh, this isn't something that the Arizona Game and Fish Department made up or Arizona made up. This is actually protocols and, and uh, uh, requirements that uh, throughout the West have been applied to other state programs. Um, when we, again, when we talk about uh, different abatement uh, possibilities of aquatic invasive species, we're not in this world alone. Arizona is one of the many states that has aquatic invasive species problems. And uh, this is how we're trying to deal with it. Some, uh, some of the states have dealt with it with uh, actually charging more to watercraft for watercraft registration, a stamp program, things of that sort. These are the things that uh, Arizona has tried to uh, uh, elicit in trying to uh, keep boaters boating and people angling and not trying to scare them uh, with what's going on. But we do need to face up to the fact that we've got some quagga mussel and some other invasive species out there. So just want to kind of keep people on, on the level on that. But, but the alternative protocols for movement, uh, the, down below it's uh, about uh, talking about New Zealand mud snails. And uh, basically it's a, it's a similar thing, treating fishing equipment, especially waders and nets. Notice those waders get in there a lot. Uh, and uh, up above uh, with the, uh, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the rock snot, we're talking about uh, disinfecting, especially felt sold waders. That's one thing that's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, we, we all try to be real uh, environmentally conscious, and those felt sold waders have been real good at helping you get into streams and maybe not falling on your butt and things of that sort. But the felt soles, uh, that's a great place for rock snot and or especially these mud snails to kind of get on in, and they stay damp for quite a while. So you may have taken these out of the water. You may have taken your waders off, and you don't go anywhere for two weeks. Maybe it's, uh, and maybe we're talking, we're not, and you're not in Phoenix, and it's not 105. Good chance they're still damp, and you, sm you still may have a, a live mud snail <laughs> hiding in your boots, for Pete's sakes. That's the beauty of aquatic invasive species, huh? Uh, but anyway, I treat fishing equipment, especially the waders, with a minimum 10-minute exposure to 5% uh, solution of quaternary ammonia. Basically, we're talking about 409, you know, spraying that kind of stuff on there. So, uh, and, and that will kill them, uh, but there you go. Uh, and, and I do want to point out that none of the stuff that we're talking about is exactly that silver bullet. We don't have any great answers for a lot of these in aquatic invasive species. And uh, we're using the experience from uh, uh, the Midwest and the Great Lakes who have really had to deal with aquatic invasive species, especially these quag and zebra mussel for 20, 30 years. And uh, this is what the research has, uh, has shown us. So, uh, if you don't mind, now let's turn our attention to the initial draft of the Arizona Aquatic Invasive Species Management Plan. Now, this came about from the guidance from the Governor's Invasive Species Advisory Council, known as ASAC. That's our little logo up there. Uh, in the 2008 Arizona Invasive Species Management Plan, which was an overriding Invasive Species, Terrestrial, and Aquatic uh, Species Management Plan. One goal of ASAC was to produce and distribute outreach materials highlighting invasive species of concern, like this poster that was made up of the 10 most unwanted invasive species in Arizona. Now, I wanted to point out that, uh, throw some arrows up here, but uh, note that half of these high-profile, non-indigenous species are aquatic in nature, for Pete's sakes. So the next step was actually the creation of a specific state plan for aquatic invasives. Now, to be perfectly honest, I'll be unable to go through this draft management plan page by page. We'd be here all night. But I wanted to point out some highlights from the executive summary that gives us a basis for this important document. Uh, this plan is an important coordination tool that can assist in communicating the scope of the many aquatic invasive species issues in and around Arizona and the desert southwest. This management plan is being developed to, hi to highlight feasible, cost-effective management practices that can be taken by the state, and this is important, in coordination with local authorities and federal partners to prevent and control current and future aquatic invasive species issues with an environmentally sound approach. This plan's overall goal is to provide sound reasoning and approaches to aquatic invasive species abatement, for which technical and financial assistance, financial assistance, I'll say that again, and coordination will be needed to reduce or eliminate aquatic invasive species risks concerning Arizona economic, 
uh, economic infrastructure, harm to the environment, and possible harm to human health. And like I said, we took this from the, uh, uh, the executive summary in the management plan. And again, uh, please check that out. That is actually in draft form. And by the way, it's the initial draft. We've, we've still got more drafts to go <laughs> of that management plan on our website, azgfd.gov uh, backslash AIS. But uh, what I want to do is uh, uh, tell you what, uh, the, what elements and sections the management plan consists of. So certainly we have goals. That's always nice to have goals. Process and participation. Uh, existing authorities and programs, because of course there are things out there that are existing and uh, we're trying to deal with different plans. Uh, certainly AIS prioritizations, uh, that is actually where you would find a, a, a more comprehensive list of things that might be coming down the pike. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of things out there that uh, could very well end up on the aquatic invasive species list here in Arizona. Sad to say, but it's true. Um, and then certainly uh, the management strategies, let me point out a few of them. Uh, coordination and implementation, certainly preventing introductions of a future aquatic invasive species, and uh, how about detecting, monitoring, and eradicating, pioneering aquatic invasive species. Be nice if we can get rid of quagga mussel. Uh, certainly control and eradicate established aquatic invasive species. Increasing and disseminating knowledge through data compilation and uh, research. Research would be nice. Uh, like I said, we've been living off of, of, uh, of folks that have done a lot of research back east the Mississippi drainage, Great Lakes area, and we've been doing some out west here. Uh, one of the things that we did find out, I'll get off topic a little bit here, but one of the things we did find out is the uh, uh, quagga mussel. Uh, one of the reasons we uh, thought we'd stop it at the 100th meridian because, hey, it's the southwest, it's hot here. Maybe we don't have enough calcium for them. Lots of things like that. We're not going to get quagga and zebra. If they get here, uh, they probably won't exist very well. Well, we, we'd be wrong. Um, they apparently uh, like it so much that... Uh, um, and back in the uh, Great Lakes area, in their natural environment, they uh, reproduce maybe once, twice a year. Here they reproduce four or five, maybe six times a year. Yeah, you just can't win. So it's a tough one out there. And then certainly informing the public, like we're doing tonight, and uh, policymakers, natural resource workers, private industry, and other user groups about the risks and impacts of these nasty things. That's certainly one of the things that we want to bring up in the management plan, and that's why we're asking for your assistance in uh, making sure we put together a good plan so we can move forward on a lot of these things. And then certainly, uh, and, and this is another nice reason to check this out, we have various appendices that include federal, state, invasive species acts, orders, regulations, and laws that are already out there. Uh, different states have different things, and uh, sometimes we like to point those out to, to show uh, what other states are, are trying to do about this and what other uh, um, uh, natural, natural, uh, eh, national recreation areas are doing, federal properties and things of that sort with uh, these beasties. And uh, certainly, Freshwater non-indigenous plant and animal listings. Again, a little more of a listing of, again, those potential things that could be coming down the road. So in closing, please send any and all comments into AIScomments at azgfd.gov. Have it up there for you to take a look at. And certainly, if you want further information, I've tried to stockpile as much as we can on our website at www.azgfd.gov backslash AIS. And uh, like I said, if you want to take a, another first-hand look at these updated director's orders, uh, go to that website. Um, uh, again, I'll repeat it, azgfd.gov uh, backslash AIS. I appreciate your attendance. Uh, this is a subject that we're probably going to be talking about for quite a few years. Um, but we'll see what the future holds. Um, I do have an audience here. And uh, I wouldn't mind opening up to some questions if you have any questions about these director's orders or or maybe there's anything else you want to talk about about the aquatic invasive species that's not a huge audience. Don. One of my major concerns is uh, Tom Reed. He's got a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, hey, Don, I tell you what, why don't you come on up here? No. Because you're probably going to say something fairly intelligent. I I'm the wrong guy to give a microphone <laughs> to. You know, we, you've done a lot of work on, uh, you know, the the what's, the why's, and, and what do we do now. We've got some uh, rules on the book for enforcement. Is there, in the management plan, uh, anything uh, lake-specific for enforcement at some of the more hazardous lakes like Mead, uh, Lake Pleasant? Lake-specific, probably not. Um, we don't, and, and the plan of this magnitude, we want to get down in the, let's call it the weeds, like that, but there are certainly sections that have to address 
the law enforcement aspect of this whole thing. Um, you know, right now in our director's orders, actually, I, let me take a step back. The AIS Interdiction Act itself does have those prohibitions and violations in there. That, uh, you know, but as a department, we don't want to just throw law enforcement in and say, well, we're just going to ticket everybody and confiscate boats. Uh, there's certainly that, that aspect that needs to be out there. Uh, and that will be in the management plan, and it is in there. And maybe it's not addressed as, as much as people would like. So, again, uh, check out the management plan and say, well, you know, you might want to, uh, what does this mean? <laughs> you know, whatever that section may be. But law enforcement is certainly one of the tools, but one of the biggest tools is people actually paying attention to their, 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 to their, their boats and their equipment and cleaning them. Uh, if it gets down to the point that, uh, uh, you know, maybe we uh, have to uh, look at establishing inspection stations, uh, decontamination points, that all sounds nice, and other states have approached that. But boy, that's co that costs a lot of money, a lot of manpower. And in fact, other states, uh, in implementing those programs, have used millions of dollars from their general fund, which I don't think Arizona has millions of dollars in their general fund waiting for us, uh, or a, a stamp program, which was very, uh, 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 and it was an aquatic invasive species stamp program. I, I believe Idaho and Oregon have that. If you have a boat in Idaho or Oregon, um, you will pay 20 maybe $30 for just to have that stamp to put on your boat. And that doesn't give you a get-out-of-jail-free card. It just tells you, it just says that, yes, I bought the stamp, and yes, you can inspect my boat now, <laughs> um, which is one thing we're trying to stay away from. First off, we really don't have the funding at this moment or the, or the person power. But there's a lot of boats that, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a state like uh, in Idaho or, or perhaps in, in Oregon or some of those, uh, our neighbors to the, to the north, uh, it ain't Lake Havasu. I'll leave it at that that coming off of Lake Havasu, inspecting every boat, yikes. But then again, we have a quagga problem in Havasu. So there's, there's questions, there's still questions out there. Like I said, none of this is really the silver bullet, but it is a, at least the best management practice approach. Good question, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I look at these people for, yes, we have another question. <laughs> You know, we're, we're seeing uh, invasive species everywhere and, and, and working shoulder to shoulder with you guys and trying to help you out. And, you know, we're doing a lot of, a lot of private sector study. We're seeing uh, the giant snakehead effect. The last time you and I talked, there was an issue here. They were selling them here, and that's freaking me out. I want to know where I can go catch them, but uh, not, not in one of our local lakes. You know, we're seeing uh, uh, the giant snakehead uh, in the eastern part of the United States. Thailand is now have... Uh, Alligator gar from Mississippi or wherever they came from. It looks like we're swapping a lot of, a lot of species. At some point in time, uh, is there any projection of what is going to work its way into the ecosystem and maybe level its, itself out? Uh, the thing that comes to mind, we have uh, the gizzard shad in a couple of our lakes, and uh, I got pretty excited when I heard about that, and I asked her young, I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, well, we're going to take a wait-and-see attitude. I said, well, what do you mean wait-and-see? Go catch them. He says, what do you suggest? So, you know, in doing some more research, my remark was unfounded, but now that I've educated myself on it, it seems that some of those, so the, the gizzard chat anyway is going to work itself into that ecosystem in a short while and become a target for the apex predators. What about some of these other things? Again, another great question. That's why we're trying to address it now. Uh, even though, let's face it, it would probably been good to address this 10, 20 years ago uh, because of, you know, quagga mussel. Um, gizzard shad, many of these other fish species especially, you know, holy cow, uh, gizzard shad are now becoming uh, uh, quite a nuisance in some of our lakes, and what do we do? Tell you the truth, again, we don't have any silver bullet answers to, to any of these things. Uh, but it's at the point that, well, maybe if we uh, were uh, in front of this thing, uh, and let's take the northern snakehead, for example. Exactly, you know, because uh, people that might be listening to this or, or will hear about this or look or read the management plan, well, what's the big deal about a northern snakehead? I mean, it's so it eats other, other fish. It, 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 and and how, how would it get here anyway? It, it, because right now, the northern snakehead, at least that we know of, uh, uh, has only gotten uh, maybe to somewhat of the Mississippi drainage in Louisiana, but it has taken uh, a hold in the Potomac, too, in northern snakehead. And, and, well, you're right, and sorry, northern California. Well, how did it get there? Well, you hit the nail on the head. It comes into the, uh, uh, the market system. It's a food fish. It, it's not going to be something people want to put in their aquarium like a piranha, uh, but, and, and, but some people actually have piranha as a food fish. Holy cow. There's just so many ways 
that aquatic invasive species and invasive species in general get into our, you know, with this global economy, we're moving things all over the place. We got quagga mussel because of uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway being opened up. These big freighters coming on in with huge amounts of stuff. They blow out their ballast waters from way across the, way across the pond there. Well, there's different species over in that part of the world <laughs> than here. But they came across. Now we dump them in the Great Lakes and they look around. The quagga mussel look around and go, hey, this is kind of nice here. They make a home out of it. To be honest, right now, you know, not, we, we didn't get rid of quagga mussel and or zebra mussel, I should say, in uh, the Great Lakes area. We're kind of living with them. Is that what we want to do? So there's kind of two levels there. You know, ones we have, trying to figure out how we're going to fit into the environment with them. It's kind of a bad deal. But what's that next horror coming down the road? Uh, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, Game and Fish has really uh, spent a lot of uh, uh, effort on, you know, don't move a muscle, the quag issue. I, uh, we're probably not going to get rid of them at Pleasant or Havasu or Mead. But I sure don't want to get them in Canyon Lake, up in the uh, White Mountains, anything like that, do we? Of course not. Um, so we've got to do what we can to stop them at, at least at that level. Uh, but we're going to have to live with them at Lake at, at Pleasant. And that's kind of a bad deal. But, you know, that, and that, that is, a, that, that's our drinking water. Let's face it, that's, that's our tub that goes up and down every year. CAP feeds it. And, uh, and then the infrastructure costs. Holy cow. And again, that's just quagga and zebra. So you bring up a great point, and that's why we're standing here today. Again, no silver bullet answers. Gizzard Chad, um, we're, we got them, and we're gonna, we're gonna see where, where they take us. Because there's no way, there, there there's no way that we see viable that, uh, to, uh, uh, exterminate, um, say gizzard jet. Um, you know, there, there and, and, uh, the, that's a great question that you ask because, uh, you know, there are, there's certainly things that kill quagga mussel or, or gizzard chat or, you know, we can kill the things, but again, the places that they're at are our drinking water <laughs> or the water that we use for our pools or things of that sort. So we need that water source. Uh, we could drain mead for a few years. It, it, of course, it's doing it itself right now, but that's just that's another subject. Um, we, we could drain mead, and uh, five years from now, we probably wouldn't have a quagga mussel problem. But that's not viable. That's, of course, not viable. Uh, there's a, a soil bacteria that actually uh, uh, some researchers are working with that do a real good job at a... Uh, I'm cutting it off. We're done. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's that aspect of uh, what can we do. Don't have a lot of answers, but we can certainly try and do due diligence in stopping them from where they're from going from where they're at right now into another area. Stop moving them around. We move them around. So anyway, <laughs> I was given the the cutoff, uh, but I do appreciate your time. Um, we'll end this webcast now. Uh, but uh, again, thank you for attending. And uh, again, if you ever have any questions or those comments, remember AIS comments. Go to that. Certainly send me your comments. I'm not sure I can answer everybody's comments and, and questions, but uh, I, I can assure you that they will be looked at. Thank you.